Oh, wait, I said number one. Number one, Trevor Lawrence. That would be a shock if he goes number two. Number one to the Jaguars. Number two, Zach Wilson to the Jets. And then he's got, and we talked last hour about this Mac Jones or Trey Lance, who's going third to the 49ers. Peter says Mac Jones. I would tend to agree with him at this point. And, uh, and look, after that, who knows what's going to happen. That's when the draft begins with the Falcons at number four. And Peter's got Kyle Pitts uh, going to the Falcons, not Trey Lance, which some think they may do, Chris. Yeah, right. I mean, that that's going to be the, the one I think everyone perks up a little bit here. I mean, the 49ers thing, again, like I said at the top of you know the show today, I, I would still expect it to be Mac Jones. But the fact that you hear this much conversation out there right now and there's nothing to benefit the 49ers – I, I got to think that there's an outside chance for Trey Lance in this conversation. But if I'm Atlanta sitting there at four, Mike, I take pits. I do. I mean, we're in 2021 like we've talked about. Matt Ryan's still got at least two or three good years, at least in them. So I, I just don't think you look for the quarterback of the future right now when you got a guy where you go, damn, you know, he can still play some pretty high-level football for us. I, the one he can hold he can hold at number eleven for a couple more years, I think. Yeah, think right. He we can keep him there, right? Just on the outside of Chris Sims' top ten, just right around there. I agree. it will be right there, perfect spot for him. But here's the other ask. Here's the other one I think that's that's like interesting in there is that uh, that Cincinnati pick, right? I mean, that Cincinnati pick to me is very interesting, and I could certainly, it, you know, a lot of people think it's Penny Sewell, right? They, they Peter's got Jamar Chase. I tend to think it might be Jamar Chase, too. You know, again, it, there's a lot of good offensive linemen in the draft. There's no doubt. They should be able to get one at the top of the second. You know, they could do it the other way around, like we talked about last week, where they could go offensive lineman at five and get a pretty good receiver, you know, at the top of the second. But I don't know if it's going to be a special one, not a special one like Jamar Chase, who's really like, I, I'd have a hard time thinking he's not a special, he's, he's kind of a can't-miss prospect. So... I, I could see that, Mike. I mean, what's your thought about them going kind of like, you know, just weapons galore there with a Jamar Chase at five? I, I have long believed that the Bengals, who are notoriously small C conservative, yeah. they, they were going to go with Penny Sewell at left tackle. They had the bad experience four years ago with John Ross, the ninth overall pick, the receiver, the fast guy they took out of Washington. Right. And that didn't work out. And last week, we played the clip of Joe Burrow talking to Chris Collinsworth and Richard Sherman about where he comes down on what they should do at number five. And he was very diplomatic. He was very tactful. And Shereen yes. Williams caught on to that and said, you know what? If he really wanted Jamar Chase, it's his college teammate. He's going to get a call from Jamar Chase saying, dude, what the hell? You should be out there pushing for me like Kyler Murray pushed for C.D. Lamb last year. But maybe Joe's playing it cool. Joe's being coy. Joe doesn't want to blow up what he's got working behind the scenes. Maybe he is working on folks to take Jamar Chase, just like Justin Herbert wants to be reunited with Penny Sewell. You know, when you already know the guy, makes your life a lot easier. It's not some new personality you have to get acquainted sure, with. Right. You know how receivers can be at yeah. times. They can be a little difficult at times. And he's the guy he's already built the relationship with. We've seen how it works. I guess it wouldn't stun me on the surface, but it would surprise me that the Bengals would do the thing that isn't the safe thing. The safe thing is yeah. Sewell. The riskier thing is Chase. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I, uh, but I think there's enough chatter in league circles to think that this is a real debate in Cincinnati right now. You know, I, I, I've been told by some people close to the situation that this is this is a little bit of a, you know, I don't want to say a civil war or anything like that, but the, the organization, this is a real conversation going on there at number five right now between Chase and Sewell. So that will be interesting. It really will be. I mean, you know, you, you're right. You said a lot of good things there. There's no doubt about it. I would think Joe Burrow's not that type of guy. He's just not that type of guy that's going to put anything out there like that. And I think at base level, he's probably going to be happy with either one. Either one's going to help his life out greatly. But, man, that chase, you know, you can almost take a little bit of a – and I know the offensive line's not set up, but when you get Cincinnati and then you throw in Jamar Chase with T. Higgins and Boyd and Joe Mixon – you start to go, whoa, that's kind of a dangerous unit there. You start to think, like, maybe they could go Mahomes, Kansas City Chiefs type, you know, explosive offense. That's the interesting angle that jumps out to it about me, uh, to me. Here's what it boils down to. One guy helps you get rid of the ball faster. The other guy lets you hold on to the ball a little bit <laughs> right. longer. Either right. way, 
Burrow's got bigger issues. He's got to get that knee healthy, and it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. Chase is either going to pump up the receiving core or Sewell is going to help Joe Burrow avoid the kind of hits he was taking last year. Look at that. And, those uh, stats. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those are they had a special connection. I, you know, this guy, this is where I just go, you know, again, like, you know, Jamar Chase, I mean, uh, you know, like you're talking about the, the receiver who who ran the fast time. They drafted uh, John Ross. Yeah. Jamar, John Ross. Yeah, he was scary. There's no doubt. But that was a speed projection type guy. This guy we saw in the SEC against the best teams dominate as a sophomore he was the best receiver in college football. Like, he'd be one of those guys where you'd go, uh, we could have broke the rules for him and let him go out. He was ready after two years. That's how talented he is, and I'm sure that's what's given the, the Bengals some, you know, some fits right behind the, 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 the scenes right now. So, under this scenario, you've got Justin Fields and Trey Lance slipping past five. They yeah. slip past six. They slip past seven. And Peter has the Panthers taking Justin Fields at eight. We talked last hour about what what are they going to do with Sam Darnold? They got him under contract this year. The option deadline for 2022 is May 3. He has them having both Trey Lance and Justin Fields at their disposal and taking Fields. How big of a surprise would that be if that happened? I would be shocked. I mean, absolutely shocked. I, I really would be. I don't even know what to say there. First off... I just don't think that's the way they want to play. You know, Carolina wants to throw the ball. That's why they signed Teddy Bridgewater, and they got Sam Darnold. And I think they were interested in Mac Jones at number eight. You know, they want a guy that's going to drop back and dissect you and pick you apart. That does not say Justin Fields to me right now at this point of his career. In fact, he's the riskiest one out of all the quarterbacks to be able to do that. By far the riskiest one. So... That's where I just – that would be shocking to me. I just don't see that happening. I really don't. I, 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 uh, so uh, I don't know what to say. I'd like to make a wager with Peter or somebody like that to go like, there's no way, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, but do I you think, think if, it's, yeah. if it's Lance and Fields on the board and they go quarterback, do you think it's more likely Fields than Lance? No, I think – At eight? Would, no. I think, I think Lance has passed up Fields in just about everybody's eyes that I know in the NFL. Anybody I've talked to, you know, people who I know, who know somebody, whatever it is, I believe Lance is in front of Fields on most teams' draft boards. I do. Because of the issues with Fields. Those, some of those issues we've talked about, are, are, they've scared teams. And I know some teams that certainly go, I just don't know if we can fix or you can fix some of those issues as far as uh, what Justin Fields has throwing the football there. So, We'll see. This is where it's going to get interesting part of the draft. But I would think ultimately Carolina is going to be looking to trade down at number eight. That would be what my money's on. Back at six, yeah. uh, I want to just point out one thing. Peter has Jalen Waddle from Alabama Ooh. going to the Dolphins. I think that's, that's the pick if it is between Waddle and Devontae Smith. I also think, Chris, if Jamar Chase is on the board at six, yeah. the Dolphins are more inclined to take Waddle, which would open the door. For the, the if the Bengals want to get cute, it would open the door for them to slide down, but we know they don't do that. They just go ahead and take the guy that, that they want. They're not gonna play games. Right. They're not gonna they're not gonna experience that hour or so of holy crap, are we gonna get our guy? Are we gonna get our guy? Did we did we outsmart ourselves? But it, there is a path to them getting chase or really Sewell. You know, that's another way to make the decision. Let someone else make it for you. Yeah, right. Let's trade back right. a few spots, and we'll take whoever's left. Yeah, no, you're, you're, they're, they could play that game, certainly. Uh, but it's a risky game to play. It definitely is. And that, hey, that, 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 that Waddle conversation at number six, that, that's interesting. I mean, that really is. I like Waddle. I don't think he's in the class of Jamar Chase and Devontae Smith. I think he's a notch down. But I do know there's people in the NFL that look at him as being like the top guy there. So that'll be interesting to see with the Miami Dolphins. They have a real need at that position. So either way, I would think they're going some sort of pass catcher there at number six. I would be surprised if, if that wasn't the case. Peter does have, as he suggested on Friday on this program, five quarterbacks going in the top nine. That is unbelievable. <laughs> 
Trey Lance would land to the Broncos under Peter's formulation. And then you get into the Cowboys. The first defensive player off the board, Patrick Sertain, the Alabama corner. Uh, and that's that's the safer pick. I know J.C. Horn's doing everything he can to try to pump himself up as the better option. But, Chris, as you say all along, you got to have straightaway speed. you got to be able to recover when the receiver runs past you. And you believe Sertain has that in uh, a yeah. better supply than J.C. Horn. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I still even question that with Sertain, but, you know, I, I understand Sertain being the number one corner in the draft. I do. I mean, it's clean. He's got everything you want. He fits what they would want to do in Dallas as far as that coverage, all that. You know, the J.C. Horn thing, everybody, you know, that's one of those where it's like everybody has Philadelphia taking J.C. Horn to where it's like on my own mock draft, I'm putting them there too because it's one of those things where it's just like, it seems like everybody knows something. So I don't I don't know. But yeah, you know, JC Horn, yeah, you know my thoughts on him. There's a lot to like, but that top end speed is a question for me. And and to me, I'm not taking a corner in the top fifteen who I don't feel like can be on an island with the elite receivers in football. I guess if uh, if everybody thinks that the Eagles are taking uh J C Horn, that says somebody's gotten a look at Jeffrey Lurie's draft board. What about what about you? What about, what is this number nine though? I mean, that's that to me, you know, the uh, number nine with the Trey Lance thing. That's that's I, I, that's going to be interesting. I, I, I mean, poor I Vic Fangio. The, the ongoing quest by the Broncos yeah. to get a quarterback and poor Vic Fangio. Hey, Vic Fangio's pink slip was signed when they hired a new GM because, as I've said time and again, every GM. When he becomes a GM, he just doesn't show up as a GM. He's been working in the league for years. He's got a list of the coaches that he wants to hire when he becomes a GM, just like Bob Quinn wanted Matt Patricia in Detroit. You've always got the guys you want. And unless coincidentally Vic Fangio is at the top of George Payton's list, Vic Fangio is already on borrowed time. So Payton's not going to draft a guy that's going to help Fangio save his ass. If anything, he's going to draft a guy that he thinks is going to help the team long-term, and also it buys a little time. You get a year with Fangio. Yeah. You hire your coach next year. Right. And uh, and th that's just the way it works. That That's why I'm a firm believer in never having this cockeyed, we kept the coach, we fired the GM, we fired the GM, we kept the coach, we fired the coach. No, fire them both or keep them both. You got to have them on the same page. And walking through the door, George Payton's not going to be on the same page with Vic Fangio. So that doesn't surprise me at all. No. They desperately want a quarterback. Desperately. And wouldn't it be great if Payton could show right out of the gates that he knows how, unlike his predecessor, to pick a quarterback in the draft. He ain't picking Brock Osweiler. He's not picking Paxton Lynch. He's he's going to get now. He better be right. But I, I, could, see, I could see George Payton wanting to do that just to prove right away that the problem solved. This is the guy who's been in – in the business for 20 years, not the guy who just showed up and was handed the keys like John Elway was 10 years ago in Denver. Yeah, no, I, I know. This it, it, is, to me, another interesting pick, and certainly I'm, I'm very intrigued with what Denver will do there at number nine. You know, I, mean, I mean, listen, again, I, I like Trey Lance and a lot of the top-end talent. It's raw, and you're going to have to play a certain way you know, early on. You know, and I do think you'll have to rely on the running a little bit, which I also want to go, man, all those good receivers, and they're going to have to have a, a quarterback a little bit more with a running predicated offense. You know, the way their team's built, you know, the rawness of Drew Locke. Now you're going to have two raw quarterbacks there. You know, I, I mean, the De Broncos are one of those teams that's kind of close. That's where I, I, for me, just looking at them as a 2021 entity just by that itself, I just go, man, Defense, top 10-ish in football. Offense, good O-line. Receivers galore. Like, could have a superstar air show with the receivers. You know, and, and they, so I just look at them going, they could be one of those teams that pops on the scene this year. And do you really want to do it with a rookie quarterback? That's where I go, like, the Drew, the Drew Locke, Teddy Bridgewater, Drew Locke, Jimmy Garoppolo thing makes a lot of sense for me. Uh, as far as their, from their standpoint, as far as where they are right now as a football team. Peter made an observation today. I just want to press pause and get your thoughts on this. Yeah. He thinks it's going to be very difficult for other teams in the top 10 to trade out yes. and trade down because of everything the 49ers gave up to move from 12 to 3. Do you... I have mixed feelings about that because I think each trade is its own thing, and you're ultimately trading for the player. You're not trading for the slot. Yeah. But uh, 
I, I, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think we're going to see fewer trades because the 49ers blew the curve to move up nine spots? I don't think so. I don't think that's going to affect anything. You know, again, what we don't know, too, is like what was being talked about at that pick number three, too. Do, do we know that the 49ers weren't, you know, uh, b- you know, bargaining with somebody else out there to get the number three spot. So that could have drove that up another pick or so, right? If there was, a, let's say Carolina was interested and they were getting the number three, that could have rose that price. So that's where I don't think you can just say it's apples to apples to move up like that. Here would be my thing, Mike, just in my take. You take the quarterbacks out of this conversation. Would I want to go, because you hear like everyone wants to trade down. Everyone wants to trade down. Everyone wants to kick picks back in the next year. The problem is, is who is there to trade up for? That's the big thing this year. You know, after you get past a few guys, I don't know if any of these guys are the type of entities where you just look at to where teams are like, oh, we got to get to 14 to get that guy. You know, as we've talked about, some of the best players in the draft are the COVID opt-outs or the, the guys that have the, the medical concerns, and they're not gonna, people aren't going to trade up in the top 10 or 15 to get those type of guys. So that's where it's going to be interesting to see how this all kind of plays out on Thursday night. And the last time we saw a gigantic return in the top 10 was that uh, RG3 trade nine years ago, and I'm looking at the top 10 picks now. There was movement. There was significant movement on draft day right. after the after so it's did. it's yeah. you're 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 investing for the player. The the challenge always is though finding someone who will trade up. And I think one of the dynamics this year, the reluctance to part ways with twenty twenty two picks because those picks, relatively speaking, more valuable because as of next year, presumably, hopefully, teams will be able to have private workouts. There'll be a scouting combine. There'll be visits. Things will be normal next year, not this this half full glass of scouting. It'll be the full cup, and they'll be able to, to have more information and more confidence when they use their picks, making the 2022 picks more valuable, making teams less likely to want to give them up to move up in a year where it's more of a crapshoot. I think that is as big of a factor as anything. I, I, I agree. I, I do. I mean, I think that that's why it's – I mean – I'm I'm expecting one of the more fun, action-packed, controversial drafts we've seen just between all the things going into this. Like you said, teams looking to trade down because of the, the 2022 pick situation and they're feeling that there's going to be more information, all of that type of stuff. Teams, I think, are going to be a little bit misinformed on a year like this. You might see teams reach for you know certain positions in this draft because you know there's there's not a premium of guys at all positions. Uh, you know, again, I'll bring up the Jalen Phillips, the Miami, I mean, the Jalen Phillips, the Miami Dolphins pass rusher. He's one of those guys you would trade up for. He's a top ten pick. I don't think there's any way he's going to go in the top ten because he's got a, you know the concussion. He's, same with Caleb Farley. You know where does he go? I go back to that. He's a he's a top five pick in any other year, but he's got a medical issue. So uh, I mean, between the quarterbacks, the COVID opt outs. Uh, and all these other storylines we've talked about, I, I think Thursday night's going to be a blast to watch. Yeah, you mentioned Jalen Phillips, the Dolphins taking him at 18 under Peter's mock draft, and then another guy that you really like, Caleb Ooh. Farley, all the way to 17 to your guy, John Gruden, taking a defensive guy with yeah. that pick. But, hey, if Farley lasts that long, if he sneaks past the Vikings at 14, the Patriots at 15, uh, then, you know, makes sense for John Gruden to jump on him. That's definitely an area of need. No, no doubt. I mean, I would think so. The other guy that I just, you know, with the Raiders and, of course, just knowing them a little bit. Yeah, you know, they could use a corner because they're not great there. But, man, they drafted a first-round corner last year. They drafted a second-round corner the year before that. They drafted a first-round safety in that same year. You know, I mean, how many draft picks are we going to use on corners? Right. At some point, some of these guys just got to play and play better. You know, that's where I just don't know if I will get behind that. I mean, it make it makes sense. The one I look at with the Raiders at 17 to just go the other option, just while we're talking Raiders, is Jeremiah Owusu Koromoa. Right. This is Gus Bradley, that Seattle defense. They want fast linebackers like a Darius Leonard or a Fred Warner. Right, Mike? To me, that would be a guy where I could see. You know, that being another option for the Raiders. It's going to, I would think it's got to be defense. They need help on defense badly. It's crappy there in in Oakland or in Las Vegas, excuse me. So uh, I wouldn't be shocked to see Farley, Owusu Koromoa, 
even maybe even a top edge pass rusher if they love to go there right now because they don't have that either. Five first round picks in the last two drafts and and look, Josh Jacobs has been very good. Um, he, he didn't necessarily have to be a first round pick. Henry Ruggs' jury is way way out. He's yeah. got the potential, but you know. It, 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 they, they really need to hit. On Jury's out on all of them. They the, need to hit. Jury's they need out to on hit. all of them, except for Jacobs, like you said. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, Clellan Farrell. I mean, the jury is out with Clellan Farrell. He wasn't worth the number four pick. We know that. So, yeah, this is a this is a big draft for for the Raiders to help their football team. You mentioned Awusa Koromoa. Peter has the Browns trading mm. up from 26 to 21 to get him. And Andrew Barry, the GM of the team, explained on Friday to reporters they have a lot of flexibility. They can, you know, Like everybody else, as we've said. Trade up, trade down, <laughs> or use their pick. They can do that. Everyone can do that except the Jaguars who can't trade up. But if the Browns trade out around one, I, this is a very real dynamic oh, right. when you're hosting the draft. You can have a lot of pissed off Cleveland people who've been sitting around all yes. night long to see what the Browns are going to do at 26. You can't trade out around one. I, I, you're, Mike, you're right. You know, I, I saw that a little bit this weekend with Andrew Berry's quotes and like, Saying how he wouldn't be a fan favorite if that happened. No, you won't. I could say, no, not only will you be hearing boos or whatever else, then what's going to be worse is they're going to put under the microscope whatever you traded away and who you pick there is going to be even magnified even more. Because it's like, hey, wait, you screwed up our draft night, and now who did you screw it up for? It better work out. So, uh, But I could, in Peter's scenario there, again, that makes sense. Just like we were talking about with the Raiders, it's the same defensive scheme the Cleveland Browns are running. It's the Seattle scheme. Joe Woods came from the 49ers who run that. So they have a real need for that kind of guy, that speed linebacker. So from, from Peter's standpoint there, that's certainly logical. I get that all the way. And, you know, when you've got a great team like the Browns now do, and it's still hard to get your mouth to – say that yeah the brain sends the message the browns ain't mouth. The, browns. the browns have a great team the brown they're in a position where this is a gravy pick for them there isn't some oh my god you've got to address this you're absolutely positively no they're they're in pretty good shape and they can and that's something that andrew barry said they're they're, they're in a spot where all the draft picks they can get guys that are going to develop you know this is the way it's supposed to go you have a good team in place good strong nucleus and you develop behind them and then as you make the strategic decisions to let some of those guys leave via free agency or trade them or whatever you've got guys that you can put into those and you just keep that conveyor belt going right right no i I'm, i mean i'm i'm with you you're right so they, they got a hell of a roster and that position you know maybe another defensive tackle the only things you can really look at on their roster to go okay we need some improvement there everything else They've done a phenomenal job. They really have. I mean, Cleveland's sitting pretty, so it would be cool to see what they do. What do you think about the Patriots' 15th overall selection? 166 pounds soaking wet, Devontae Smith. I, I, I just have a hard time thinking Devontae Smith is going to be on the board still at that point. You know, I, I just know from, from my own studies and just people I've talked to around the NFL, Mike, People are enamored with Devontae Smith. Now, I mean, I know the weight thing is real. And the, like we talked about it last week, the little of the scary thing is just like if he gets hurt, people are going to be like, I told you so. But that's the only thing. There's nothing to make you believe that. I mean, I, I hear – I've had some coaches tell me like, man, Devontae Smith is as good as any receiver I've ever evaluated. So that's where I just don't see him being around at that point. Uh, but that would be ooh, that would be interesting. You add him to that offense now with the two receivers they signed in free agency and that O line and Cam Newton. That could be scary. That could be scary speed coming out of uh, New England. I look at it this way: there's got to be somebody who loves the guy enough before 15, yeah. or somebody after 15 who loves him enough to spring up and get him. I would think he'd be one of those guys. I agree. I agree. Mike, That this could be one of those guys, if he's hanging around at 8 or 9 or 10, that you see a guy that there's that's a truly a, a legitimate trade-up type talent. I think your point right, is real there. People are going to look at it and go, man, the route running, the feet, you know, when the ball's in his hands and the pure speed and playmaking ability of the guy, it, it's, it's off the charts good. So – it's uh, a it's a good thing it's a good thing that the Chiefs have already traded their first round pick. Oh, imagine because I would my God could yes <laughs> could you uh, Tyree Kill Devontae Smith 
and Mikol Hardman. Ooh, Good man. Lord. Man, that would be fun to watch. There's no doubt. Uh, but that I'd, I'd be excited to see the Patriots get Devontae Smith. I just have a hard time thinking he'll be there at 15. You know, I'm starting to have all sorts of crazy ideas and thoughts about how the Chiefs could get Devontae Smith, but I'm just going to – I'm not, I'm not going to entertain that rabbit hole because I'm now fascinated by – the, the possibility of him and Patrick Mahomes being on the same field together. I'd never considered it until just now. Well, it's not going to happen. So don't worry. We're, they're, 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 they've made their bed. They went with a huge giant left tackle instead. So that's what they're going with. The, the, the other thing I don't like about Devonte Smith going to the Patriots at 15, that means the Vikings would pass on him at 14. I don't know how I feel about that. Either. Uh, yeah, I know, but you not guys, they need him. Well, yeah, they need him. you don't need them, especially the way you guys run your offense and, well, I mean, let's talk about your Vikings for a second. I mean, I got to think it's pass rusher or offense alignment, right? One of the two. I mean, I guess if you made me bet money with that offense and, you know, you got Clint Kubiak as the new OC and everything like that, I would think they got to go with the offense alignment, the best one available there at that point. Yeah, they, uh, the Peter has a Lehigh Vera Tucker from USC. Yeah. Flexibility, guard and tackle. Guard. Yeah. There needs to be a guy that can do the – the zone blocking. Uh, he can do that. And, that makes yeah, sense. So that, that, that's what they need. It's not a sexy pick, but it's an infrastructure pick, and that's what the Vikings need because we know with Kirk Cousins he can run the play that's called, and if the play that's called doesn't work, that's the end of it. So he loves with him. Riley Reef gone, he loves they, him they, I'm just he loves being him. realistic he loves about him what not. <laughs> the needs are. It, you know, the thing about the draft, the skill position players are the ones who get the people most excited, yes. but it is the infrastructure guys that lay the foundation for a team to be great. You have got to build from the inside out, but that just isn't interesting. No, it's not. When, when draft night rolls around, what's interesting is Devonte Smith and the quarterbacks and uh, Peter has two running backs. I, that's, I talked that. last week. You don't think there's going to be any, he's got two going in round one, starting with the Steelers, Najee Harris from Alabama. Hey, I, I, I saw that, and, uh, you know, uh, I had to do my own mock draft, and I'm not going to lie, I thought about the Steelers with Travis Etienne from Clemson as being a possibility, but, yeah, I decided not to. I, I mean, you know, I, I understand that from the Steelers' standpoint and all that, but, man, you know, again, I just, first off, I don't really think any of these running backs are first-round type talents other than Etienne, and I think that's borderline. And really with the Steelers, too, I mean, as we've discussed, they got offensive line issues. I got to think they're thinking some sort of offensive lineman there at 24 that could be plug and play this year. So uh, they could wait to the second or third round to get a running back. Uh, but but that's interesting thought. I'd be shocked to see if any of these running backs go. I will. I've been saying that they need a Franco Harris type. They need. Yeah, he would that fit move. that. And Najee. Harris was the 13th overall pick in 1972 i'm looking now the steelers have used first round picks on running backs more than a few times over the course of their their existence but it's been a while i think the last one when's the last Le'Veon tim worley in 1989 right? yeah. yeah tim tim worley no oh, rashard mendenhall first round oh, pick in 2008 North the Carolina. last year they won a super bowl wow. maybe 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 there's maybe there's some some kismet there. Maybe you, you you take a running back in the first round now, and it works out the way it did when they took Rashard Mendenhall out of Illinois back in 2008. I remember that now. So, look, the Steelers are not afraid to draft for need, and they're yeah. not afraid to trade up to get the guy they want. Right. And I I don't rule them out. If, if one of these quarterbacks makes it past 10 and starts to slide – if they really love the guy, and they're not going to tell us ahead of time, I wouldn't rule the Steelers out from making a move to try to go ahead and get their their guy that's going to take the baton from Ben Roethlisberger in 2022. I, I they hear saw you. what happens when you don't have a franchise quarterback. You go 20 years with a revolving door of mediocrity. I still don't know how they got to a Super Bowl yeah. between the Terry Bradshaw and Ben Roethlisberger years. I I, I mean, I, I hear you. I think if there's a if like one of those quarterbacks, maybe a Lance or Fields falls, uh, I would think Pittsburgh's got to think about that to a degree. I do. I guess the only thing that would make me think no with that is just like, you know, again, it goes back to a, like a little bit of our Tom Brady conversation to where like, hey, they got Big Ben, you know, and I know, hey, the, it, it, that'll be a tough balance, but it's just like, do they want to go all in on Big Ben one more year and get something that's going to help the team right now this second? That's the decision the Steelers will have to make. I think when they – 
made the decision to keep Roethlisberger around, it did skew toward going all in. I'd be very, very surprised if they would use their first round pick and or future assets on a quarterback now. Far more likely, I think, they stay where they are and see which running backs there and and try to add to this this thing they've convinced themselves they can do, which is go back to zero and zero and start winning game after game after game like they did last year and not have it all fall apart down the stretch. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.